atmospheric entry is the movement of an object into and through the gases of a planet's atmosphere from outer space. There are two main types of atmospheric entry, uncontrolled entry, such as in the entry of astronomical objects, space debris or bolids, and controlled entry, such as the entry of technology capable of being navigated or following a predetermined course. Atmospheric drag and aerodynamic heating can cause atmospheric breakup capable of completely disintegrating smaller objects. These forces may cause objects with lower compressive strength to explode. For Earth, atmospheric entry occurs above the car RMAN line at an altitude of more than 100 km above the surface while at Venus atmospheric entry occurs at 250 km and at Mars atmospheric entry at about 80 km uncontrolled. Objects accelerate through the atmosphere at extreme velocities under the influence of Earth's gravity. Most controlled objects enter at hypersonic speeds due to their suborbital, orbital, or unbounded trajectories. Various advanced technologies have been developed to enable atmospheric re-entry and flight at extreme velocities. An alternative low-velocity method of controlled atmospheric entry is buoyancy which is suitable for planetary entry where thick atmospheres Strong gravity or both factors complicate high-velocity hyperbolic entry, such as the atmospheres of Venus, Titan and the gas giants. History The concept of the ablative heat shield was described as early as 1920 by Robert Goddard, in the case of meteors, which enter the atmosphere with speeds as high as 30 miles per second, the interior of the meteors remains cold, and the erosion is due, to a large extent. To chipping or cracking of the suddenly heated surface. For this reason, if the outer surface of the apparatus were to consist of layers of a very infusible hard substance with layers of a poor heat conductor between, the surface would not be eroded to any considerable extent, especially as the velocity of the apparatus would not be nearly so great as that of the average meteor. Practical development of re-entry systems began as the range and re-entry velocity of ballistic missiles increased. For early short-range missiles, like the V-2, stabilization and aerodynamic stress were important issues, but heating was not a serious problem. Medium-range missiles like the Soviet R-5, with a 1200 km range, required ceramic composite heat shielding on separable re-entry vehicles. The first ICBMs, with ranges of 8,000 to 12,000 km, were only possible with the development of modern ablative heat shields and blunt-shaped vehicles. In the USA, this technology was pioneered by H. Julian Allen at Ames Research Center. Terminology, definitions and jargon, over the decades since the 1950s, a rich technical jargon has grown around the engineering of vehicles designed to enter planetary atmospheres. It is recommended that the reader review the jargon glossary before continuing with this article on atmospheric re-entry. When atmospheric entry is part of a spacecraft landing or recovery, particularly on a planetary body other than Earth, entry is part of a phase referred to as entry, descent and landing, or EDL. Blunt Body Entry Vehicles These four shadow graph images represent early re-entry vehicle concepts. A shadow graph is a process that makes visible the disturbances that occur in a fluid flow at high velocity, in which light passing through a flowing fluid is refracted by the density gradients in the fluid resulting in bright and dark areas on a screen placed behind the fluid. In the United States, H. Julian Allen and A. J. Eggers, Jr. of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics made the counterintuitive discovery in 1951 that a blunt shape made the most effective heat shield. From simple engineering principles, Allen and Eggers showed that the heat load experienced by an entry vehicle was inversely proportional to the drag coefficient, that is the greater the drag, the less the heat load. If the re-entry vehicle is made blunt, air cannot get out of the way quickly enough, and acts as an air cushion to push the shock wave and heated shock layer forward. Since most of the hot gases are no longer in direct contact with the vehicle, the heat energy would stay in the shocked gas and simply move around the vehicle to later dissipate into the atmosphere. The Allen and Eggers discovery, though initially treated as a military secret, was eventually published in 1958. Entry Vehicle Shapes There are several basic shapes used in designing entry vehicles. Equals sphere or spherical section equals 
The simplest axisymmetric shape is the sphere or spherical section. This can either be a complete sphere or a spherical section for body with a converging conical after body. The aerodynamics of a sphere or spherical section are easy to model analytically using Newtonian impact theory. Likewise, the spherical section's heat flux can be accurately modeled with the Fay-Riedel equation. The static stability of a spherical section is assured if the vehicle's center of mass is upstream from the center of curvature. Pure spheres have no lift. However, by flying at an angle of attack, a spherical section has modest aerodynamic lift thus providing some cross-range capability and widening its entry corridor. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, high-speed computers were not yet available and computational fluid dynamics were still embryonic. Because the spherical section was amenable to closed-form analysis, that geometry became the default for conservative design. Consequently, Man capsules of that era were based upon the spherical section. Pure spherical entry vehicles were used in the early Soviet Vostok and Voskhod and in Soviet Mars and Venera descent vehicles. The Apollo Command Service module used a spherical section for body heat shield with a converging conical after body. It flew a lifting entry with a hypersonic trim angle of attack of a 27 a degree to yield an average LD of 0.368. This angle of attack was achieved by precisely offsetting the vehicle's center of mass from its axis of symmetry. Other examples of the spherical section geometry in man capsules are Soyuz Zund, Gemini and Mercury. Even these small amounts of lift allow trajectories that have very significant effects on peak G-force trajectory to 4-5G, as well as greatly reducing the peak re-entry heat. Equals sphere cone equals the sphere cone is a spherical section with a thrust and more blunted cone attached. The sphere cone's dynamic stability is typically better than that of a spherical section. With a sufficiently small half angle and properly placed center of mass, a sphere cone can provide aerodynamic stability from capillarian entry to surface impact. The original American sphere cone M shell was the MK2 RV, which was developed in 1955 by the General Electric Corporation. The MK2's design was derived from blunt body theory and used a radiatively cooled thermal protection system based upon a metallic heat shield. The MK2 had significant defects as a weapon delivery system, that is, it loitered too long in the upper atmosphere due to its lower ballistic coefficient and also trailed a stream of vaporized metal making it very visible to radar. These defects made the MK2 overly susceptible to anti-ballistic missile systems. Consequently, an alternative sphere cone RV to the MK2 was developed by General Electric. This new RV was the MK6 which used a non-metallic ablative TPS. This new TPS was so effective as a re-entry heat shield that significantly reduced bluntness was possible. However, the MK6 was a huge RV with an entry mass of 3360 kilograms, a length of 3.1 meters and a half angle of 12.5 degree. Subsequent advances in nuclear weapon and ablative TPS design allowed RVs to become significantly smaller with a further reduced bluntness ratio compared to the MK6. Since the 1960s, the sphere cone has become the preferred geometry for modern ICBM RVs with typical half angles being between 10 a degree to 11 a degree. Reconnaissance satellite RVs also used a sphere cone shape and were the first American example of a non-munition entry vehicle. The sphere cone was later used for space exploration missions to other celestial bodies or for return from open space. For example, Stardust Probe. Unlike with military RVs, the advantage of the blunt body's lower TPS mass remained with space exploration entry vehicles like the Galileo Probe with a half angle of 45 a degree or the Viking Emma shell with a half angle of 70 a degree. Space exploration sphere cone entry vehicles have landed on the surface or entered the atmospheres of Mars, Venus, Jupiter and Titan. Equals Biconic equals, the Biconic is a sphere cone with an additional frustum attached. The Biconic offers a significantly improved LD ratio. A Biconic designed for Mars era capture typically has an LD of approximately 1.0 compared to an LD of 0.368 for the Apollo CM. 
the higher LD makes a biconic shape better suited for transporting people to Mars due to the lower peak deceleration. Arguably, the most significant biconic ever flown was the advanced maneuverable re-entry vehicle. Four AMARVs were made by the McDonnell Douglas Corporation and represented a significant leap in RV sophistication. Three of the AMARVs were launched by Minuteman 1 ICBMs on December 20, 1979, October 8, 1980 and October 4, 1981. AMARV had an entry mass of approximately 470 kg, a nose radius of 2.34 cm, a forward frustum half angle of 10.4 degree, an interfrustum radius of 14.6 cm, aft frustum half angle of 6 a degree, and an axial length of 2.079 m. No accurate diagram or picture of AMARV has ever appeared in the open literature. However, a schematic sketch of an AMARV-like vehicle along with trajectory plots showing hairpin turns has been published. AMARV's attitude was controlled through a split-body flap along with two yaw flaps mounted on the vehicle's sides. Hydraulic actuation was used for controlling the flaps. AMARV was guided by a fully autonomous navigation system designed for evading anti-ballistic missile interception. The McDonnell Douglas DCX was essentially a scaled-up version of AMARV. AMARV and the DCX also served as the basis for an unsuccessful proposal for what eventually became the Lockheed Martin 1033. Equals non-axisymmetric shapes equals non-axisymmetric shapes have been used for manned entry vehicles. One example is the winged orbit vehicle that uses a delta wing for maneuvering during descent much like a conventional glider. This approach has been used by the American Space Shuttle and the Soviet Buran. The lifting body is another entry vehicle geometry and was used with the X-23 Prime vehicle. The first system was an aerojet proposal for an inflated spar rogue low wing made up from inconel wire cloth impregnated with silicon rubber and silicon carbide dust. First was proposed in both one-man and six-man versions, used for emergency escape and re-entry of stranded space station crews and was based on an earlier unmanned test program that resulted in a partially successful re-entry flight from space, but otherwise it appears the concept would have worked. Even with the fairing dragging it, the test article flew stably on re-entry until burn through. The proposed MU system would have used a one-man inflatable ballistic capsule as an emergency astronaut entry vehicle. This concept was carried further by the Douglas Paracon project. While these concepts were unusual, the inflated shape on re-entry was in fact axisymmetric. Shock leg gas physics, an approximate rule of thumb used by heat shield designers for estimating peak shock leg temperature is to assume the air temperature in kelvins to be equal to the entry speed in meters per second a euro a mathematical coincidence. For example, a spacecraft entering the atmosphere at 7.8 km per second would experience a peak shock lead temperature of 7,800 kelvins. This is unexpected, since the kinetic energy increases with the square of the velocity and can only occur because the specific heat of the gas increases greatly with temperature. At typical re-entry temperatures, the air in the shock layer is both ionized and dissociated. This chemical dissociation necessitates various physical models to describe the shock layer's thermal and chemical properties. There are four basic physical models of a gas that are important to aeronautical engineers who design heat shields. Equals perfect gas model equals, almost all aeronautical engineers are taught the perfect gas model during their undergraduate education. Most of the important perfect gas equations along with their corresponding tables and graphs are shown in NACA Report 1135. Excerpts from NACA Report 1135 often appear in the appendices of thermodynamics textbooks and are familiar to most aeronautical engineers who design supersonic aircraft. The perfect gas theory is elegant and extremely useful for designing aircraft but assumes that the gas is chemically inert. From the standpoint of aircraft design, air can be assumed to be inert for temperatures less than 550 kelvins at one atmosphere pressure. The perfect gas theory begins to break down at 550K and is not usable at temperatures greater than 2000 kelvins. For temperatures greater than 2000 kelvins, a heat shield designer must use a real gas model. 
equals real gas model equals, an entry vehicle's pitching moment can be significantly influenced by real gas effects. Both the Apollo CM and a space shuttle were designed using incorrect pitching moments determined through inaccurate real gas modeling. The Apollo CM's trim angle angle of attack was higher than originally estimated, resulting in a narrower lunar return entry corridor. The actual aerodynamic center of the Columbia was upstream from the calculated value due to real gas effects. On Columbia Euro unregistered trademark S made in flight, astronauts John W. Young and Robert Crippen had some anxious moments during re-entry when there was concern about losing control of the vehicle. An equilibrium real gas model assumes that a gas is chemically reactive, but also assumes all chemical reactions have had time to complete and all components of the gas of the same temperature. When air is processed by a shock wave, it is superheated by compression and chemically dissociates through many different reactions. Direct friction upon the re-entry object is not the main cause of shock layer heating. It is caused mainly from ice and tropic heating of the air molecules within the compression wave. Friction-based entropy increases of the molecules within the wave also account for some heating. The distance from the shock wave to the stagnation point on the entry vehicle's leading edge is called shock wave standoff. An approximate rule of thumb for shock wave standoff distance is 0.14 times the nose radius. One can estimate the time of travel for a gas molecule from the shock wave to the stagnation point by assuming a free stream velocity of 7.8 km per second and a nose radius of 1 m, that is, time of travel is about 18 microseconds. This is roughly the time required for shock wave initiated chemical dissociation to approach chemical equilibrium in a shock layer for a 7.8 km per second entry into air during peak heat flux. Consequently, as air approaches the entry vehicle's stagnation point, the air effectively reaches chemical equilibrium thus enabling an equilibrium model to be usable. For this case, most of the shock layer between the shock wave and leading edge of an entry vehicle is chemically reacting and not in a state of equilibrium. The Fay-Riedel equation, which is of extreme importance towards modeling heat flux, owes its validity to the stagnation point being in chemical equilibrium. The time required for the shock layer gas to reach equilibrium is strongly dependent upon the shock layer's pressure. For example, in the case of the Galileo probe's entry into Jupiter's atmosphere, the shock layer was mostly in equilibrium during peak heat flux due to the very high pressures experienced. Determining the thermodynamic state of the stagnation point is more difficult under an equilibrium gas model than a perfect gas model. Under a perfect gas model, the ratio of specific heats is assumed to be constant along with the gas constant. For a real gas, the ratio of specific heats can wildly oscillate as a function of temperature. Under a perfect gas model there is an elegant set of equations for determining thermodynamic state along a constant entropy streamline called the isentropic chain. For a real gas, the isentropic chain is unusable and a Molly diagram would be used instead for manual calculation. However, graphical solution with a Molly diagram is now considered obsolete with modern heat shield designers using computer programs based upon a digital lookup table or a chemistry-based thermodynamics program. The chemical composition of a gas in equilibrium with fixed pressure and temperature can be determined through the Gibbs free energy method. Gibbs free energy is simply the total enthalpy of the gas minus its total entropy times temperature. A chemical equilibrium program normally does not require chemical formulas or reaction rate equations. The program works by preserving the original elemental abundances specified for the gas and varying the different molecular combinations of the elements through numerical iteration until the lowest possible Gibbs free energy is calculated. The database for a Gibbs free energy program comes from spectroscopic data used in defining partition functions. Among the best equilibrium codes in existence is the program Chemical Equilibrium with Applications which was written by Bonnie J. McBride and Sanford Gordon at NASA Lewis. Other names for CEA are the Gordon and McBride code, and the Lewis code. CEA is quite accurate up to 10,000 K for planetary atmospheric gases, but unusable beyond 20,000 K CEA can be downloaded from the Internet along with full documentation and will compile on Linux under the G77 Fortran compiler. Equals real gas model equals, 
A non-equilibrium real gas model is the most accurate model of a shock layer's gas physics, but is more difficult to solve than an equilibrium model. The simplest non-equilibrium model is the Lighthill-Freeman model. The Lighthill-Freeman model initially assumes a gas made up of a single diatomic species susceptible to only one chemical formula and its reverse. For example, N2 N plus N and N plus N and N2. Because of its simplicity, the Lighthill-Freeman model is a useful pedagogical tool, but is unfortunately too simple for modeling non-equilibrium air. Air is typically assumed to have a mole fraction composition of 0.7812 molecular nitrogen, 0.2095 molecular oxygen and 0.0093 argon. The simplest real gas model for air is the five species model which is based upon N2, O2, NO, AN and O. The five species model assumes no ionization and ignores trace species like carbon dioxide. When running a Gibbs free energy equilibrium program, the iterative process from the originally specified molecular composition to the final calculated equilibrium composition is essentially random and not time accurate. With a non-equilibrium program, the computation process is time accurate and follows a solution path dictated by chemical and reaction rate formulas. The five species model has 17 chemical formulas. The Lighthill-Freeman model is based upon a single ordinary differential equation and one algebraic equation. The five species model is based upon five ordinary differential equations and 17 algebraic equations. Because the five ordinary differential equations are loosely coupled, the system is numerically stiff, and difficult to solve. The five species model is only usable for entry from low Earth orbit where entry velocity is approximately 7.8 km per second. For lunar return entry of 11 km per second, the shock layer contains a significant amount of ionized nitrogen and oxygen. The five species model is no longer accurate and a 12 species model must be used instead. High speed Mars entry which involves a carbon dioxide. Nitrogen and argon atmosphere is even more complex requiring a 19 species model. An important aspect of modeling non-equilibrium real gas effects is radiative heat flux. If a vehicle is entering an atmosphere at very high speed and has a large nose radius then radiative heat flux can dominate TPS heating. Radiative heat flux during entry into an air or carbon dioxide atmosphere typically comes from asymmetric diatomic molecules. For example, cyanogen, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, single ionized molecular nitrogen etc. These molecules are formed by the shock wave dissociating ambient atmospheric gas followed by recombination within the shock layer into new molecular species. The newly formed diatomic molecules initially have a very high vibrational temperature that efficiently transforms the vibrational energy into radiant energy. That is, radiative heat flux. The whole process takes place in less than a millisecond which makes modeling a challenge. The experimental measurement of radiative heat flux along with theoretical calculation through the unsteady schrer paragraph dingo equation are among the more esoteric aspects of aerospace engineering. Most of the aerospace research work related to understanding radiative heat flux was done in the 1960s but largely discontinued after conclusion of the Apollo program. Radiative heat flux in air was just sufficiently understood to ensure Apollo's success. However, radiative heat flux in carbon dioxide is still barely understood and will require major research. Equals frozen gas model equals, the frozen gas model describes a special case of a gas that is not in equilibrium. The name frozen gas can be misleading. A frozen gas is not frozen like ice is frozen water. Rather a frozen gas is frozen in time. Chemical reactions are normally driven by collisions between molecules. If gas pressure is slowly reduced such that chemical reactions can continue then the gas can remain in equilibrium. However, it is possible for gas pressure to be so suddenly reduced that almost all chemical reactions stop. For that situation the gas is considered frozen. The distinction between equilibrium and frozen is important because it is possible for a gas such as air to have significantly different properties for the same thermodynamic state. For example, pressure and temperature. 
frozen gas can be a significant issue in the wake behind an entry vehicle. During re-entry, free-stream air is compressed to high temperature and pressure by the entry vehicle's shock wave. Non-equilibrium air in the shock layer is then transported past the entry vehicle's leading side into a region of rapidly expanding flow that causes freezing. The frozen air can then be entrained into a trailing vortex behind the entry vehicle. Correctly modeling the flow in the wake of an entry vehicle is very difficult. Thermal protection shield heating in the vehicle's afterbody is usually not very high, but the geometry and unsteadiness of the vehicle's wake can significantly influence aerodynamics and particularly dynamic stability. Thermal protection systems A thermal protection system or TPS is the barrier that protects a spacecraft during the searing heat of atmospheric re-entry. A secondary goal may be to protect the spacecraft from the heat and cold of space while on orbit. Multiple approaches for the thermal protection of spacecraft are in use, among them ablative heat shields, passive cooling and active cooling of spacecraft surfaces. Equals ablative equals. The ablative heat shield functions by lifting the hot shock layer gas away from the heat shield's outer wall. The boundary layer comes from blowing of gaseous reaction products from the heat shield material and provides protection against all forms of heat flux. The overall process of reducing the heat flux experienced by the heat shield's outer wall by way of a boundary layer is called blockage. Ablation occurs at two levels in an ablative TPS, the outer surface of the TPS material chars, melts, and sublimes, while the bulk of the TPS material undergoes pyrolysis and expels product gases. The gas produced by pyrolysis is what drives blowing and causes blockage of convective and catalytic heat flux. Pyrolysis can be measured in real time using thermogravimetric analysis, so that the ablative performance can be evaluated. Ablation can also provide blockage against radiative heat flux by introducing carbon into the shock layer thus making it optically opaque. Radiative heat flux blockage was the primary thermal protection mechanism of the Galileo probe TPS material. Carbon phenolic was originally developed as a rocket nozzle throat material and for re-entry vehicle nose tips. Early research on ablation technology in the USA was centered at NASA's Ames Research Center located at Moffett Field, California. Ames Research Center was ideal, since it had numerous wind tunnels capable of generating varying wind velocities. Initial experiments typically mounted a mock-up of the ablative material to be analyzed within a hypersonic wind tunnel. Testing of ablative materials occurs at the Ames Arcade Jet Complex. Many spacecraft thermal protection systems have been tested in this facility, including the Apollo, Space Shuttle, and Orion heat shield materials. The thermal conductivity of a particular TPS material is usually proportional to the material's density. Carbon phenolic is a very effective ablative material, but also has high density which is undesirable. If the heat flux experienced by an entry vehicle is insufficient to cause pyrolysis then the TPS material's conductivity could allow heat flux conduction into the TPS bondline material thus leading to TPS failure. Consequently, for entry trajectories causing lower heat flux, Carbon phenolic is sometimes inappropriate and lower density TPS materials such as the following examples can be better design choices. SLA-561B, SLA in SLA-561B stands for Super Lightweight Ablator. SLA-561B is a proprietary ablative made by Lockheed Martin that has been used as the primary TPS material on all of the 70-degree sphere cone entry vehicles sent by NASA to Mars other than the Mars Science Laboratory. SLA-561V begins significant ablation at a heat flux of approximately 110 with Mars squared, but will fail for heat fluxes greater than 300 with Mars squared. The MSLA Rochelle TPS is currently designed to withstand a peak heat flux of 234 with Kmars squared. The peak heat flux experienced by the Viking 1 M Rochelle which landed on Mars was 21 with Kmars squared. For Viking 1, the TPS acted as a charred thermal insulator and never experienced significant ablation. Viking 1 was the first Mars lander and based upon a very conservative design. The Viking M Rochelle had a base diameter of 3.54 meters. 
SLA 561B is applied by packing the ablative material into a honeycomb core that is pre-bonded to the Engel shell structure thus enabling construction of a large heat shield. Pica, phenolic impregnated carbon ablator, a carbon fiber preform impregnated in phenolic resin, pica is a modern TPS material and has the advantages of low density coupled with efficient ablative capability at high heat flux. It is a good choice for ablative applications such as high peak heating conditions found on sample return missions or lunar return missions. Pica's thermal conductivity is lower than other high heat flux ablative materials, such as conventional carbon phenolics. Pica was patented by NASA Ames Research Center in the 1990s and was the primary TPS material for the Stardust Elmer shell. The Stardust sample return capsule was the fastest man-made object ever to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. This was faster than the Apollo mission capsules and 70% faster than the shuttle. Pica was critical for the viability of the Stardust mission, which returned to Earth in 2006. Stardust's heat shield was manufactured from a single monolithic piece size to withstand a nominal peak heating rate of 1.2 watts per centimeter 2. A pica heat shield has also been used for the Mars Science Laboratory entry into the Martian atmosphere. Equals pica X equals, an improved and easier to manufacture version called pica X was developed by SpaceX in 2006-2010 for the Dragon space capsule. The first re-entry test of a pica X heat shield was on the Dragon C-1 mission on December 8, 2010. The pica X heat shield was designed developed and fully qualified by a small team of only a dozen engineers and technicians in less than four years. PicaX is ten times less expensive to manufacture than the NASA Pica heat shield material. The Dragon 1 spacecraft initially used Pica X version 1 and was later equipped with version 2. The Dragon V2 spacecraft uses Pica X version 3. SpaceX has indicated that each new version of Pica X primarily improves upon heat shielding capacity rather than the manufacturing cost. SISCA Silicon impregnated reusable ceramic ablator was also developed at NASA Ames Research Center and was used on the back shell interface plate of the Mars Pathfinder and Mars Exploration Rover Emma shells. The BIP was at the attachment points between the Emma shells back shell and the cruise ring. SISCA was also the primary TPS material for the unsuccessful Deep Space 2 Mars impactor probes with their 0.35 M base diameter Engel shells. SISCA is a monolithic, insulating material that can provide thermal protection through ablation. It is the only TPS material that can be machined to custom shapes and then applied directly to the spacecraft. There is no post processing, heat treating, or additional coatings required. Since SISCA can be machined to precise shapes, it can be applied as tiles, leading edge sections, full nose caps, or in any number of custom shapes or sizes. As of 1996, SISCA had been demonstrated in backshell interface applications, but not yet as a full body TPS material. Evoat, Evoat is a NASA specified ablative heat shield a glass-filled epoxy Novolac system. NASA originally used it for the Apollo capsule and then utilized the material for its next generation beyond low-Earth orbit Orion spacecraft. The EVOAT to be used on Orion has been reformulated to meet environmental legislation that has been passed since the end of Apollo. Equals thermal soak equals. Thermal soak is a part of almost all TPS schemes. For example, an ablative heat shield loses most of his thermal protection effectiveness when the outer wall temperature drops below the minimum necessary for pyrolysis. From that time to the end of the heat pulse, heat from the shock layer convects into the heat shield's outer wall and would eventually conduct to the payload. This outcome is prevented by ejecting the heat shield prior to the heat conducting to the inner wall. Typical Space Shuttle TPS tiles have remarkable thermal protection properties. An LI-900 tile exposed to a temperature of 1000 kelvins on one side will remain merely warm to the touch on the other side. However, they are relatively brittle and break easily, and cannot survive in flight rain. Equals passively cooled equals, in some early ballistic missile RVs. For example, the MK-2 and the suborbital Mercury spacecraft, 
radiatively cooled TPS were used to initially absorb heat flux during the heat pulse and then, after the heat pulse, radiate and convect the stored heat back into the atmosphere. However, the earlier version of this technique required a considerable quantity of metal TPS. Modern designers prefer to avoid this added mass by using ablative and thermal soak TPS instead. Radiatively cooled TPS can still be found on modern entry vehicles, but reinforced carbon carbon is normally used instead of metal. RCC is the TPS material on the Space Shuttle's nose cone and wing leading edges. RCC was also proposed as the leading edge material for the X-33. Carbon is the most refractory material known with a 1 atmosphere sublimation temperature of 3825 degrees Celsius for graphite. This high temperature made carbon an obvious choice as a radiatively cooled TPS material. Disadvantages of RCC are that it is currently very expensive to manufacture and lacks impact resistance. Some high-velocity aircraft, such as the SR-71 Blackbird and Concorde, deal with heating similar to that experienced by spacecraft but at much lower intensity and for hours at a time. Studies of the SR-71's titanium skin revealed the metal structure was restored to its original strength through annealing due to aerodynamic heating. In the case of Concorde, the aluminum nose was permitted to reach a maximum operating temperature of 127 degrees Celsius. The metallurgical implications that would be associated with a higher peak temperature were the most significant factors determining the top speed of the aircraft. A radiatively cooled TPS for an entry vehicle is often called a hot metal TPS. Early TPS designs for the Space Shuttle called for a hot metal TPS based upon nickel superalloy and titanium shingles. The earlier Shuttle TPS concept was rejected because it was believed a silica tile based TPS offered less expensive development and manufacturing costs. A nickel superalloy shingle TPS was again proposed for the unsuccessful X-33 single stage to orbit prototype. Recently, new irradiatively cooled TPS materials have been developed that could be superior to RCC. Referred to by their prototype vehicle slender hypervelocity aerothermodynamic research probe, these TPS materials have been based upon substances such as zirconium dibride and hafnium dibride. Sharp TPS have suggested performance improvements allowing for sustained Mach 7 flight at sea level, Mach 11 flight at 100,000 feet altitudes, and significant improvements for vehicles designed for continuous hypersonic flight. Sharp TPS materials enable sharp leading edges and nose cones to greatly reduce drag for air breathing combined cycle propelled spaceplanes and lifting bodies. Sharp materials have exhibited effective TPS characteristics from 0 to more than 2,000 degrees Celsius, with melting points over 3,500 degrees Celsius. They are structurally stronger than RCC, thus do not require structural reinforcement with materials such as inconel. Sharp materials are extremely efficient at re-radiating absorbed heat, thus eliminating the need for additional TPS behind and between sharp materials and conventional vehicle structure. NASA initially funded a multi-phase and d program through the University of Montana in 2001 to test sharp materials on test vehicles. Equals actively cooled equals, various advanced reusable spacecraft and hypersonic aircraft designs have been proposed to employ heat shields made from temperature-resistant metal alloys that incorporated a refrigerant or cryogenic fuel circulating through them. Such a TPS concept was proposed for the X-30 National Aerospace Plane. The NASP was supposed to have been a scramjet-powered hypersonic aircraft, but failed in development. In the early 1960s various TPS systems were proposed to use water or other cooling liquid sprayed into the shock layer, or passed through channels in the heat shield. Advantages included the possibility of more all-metal designs which would be cheaper to develop, be more rugged, and eliminate the need for classified technology. The disadvantages are increased weight and complexity, and lower reliability. The concept has never been flown but a similar technology did undergo extensive ground testing. Feathered re-entry In 2004, aircraft designer Bert Rutan demonstrated the feasibility of a shape-changing airfoil for re-entry with the suborbital spaceship One. 
the wings on this craft rotate upward into the feather configuration that provides a shuttlecock effect. Thus Spaceship One achieves much more aerodynamic drag on re-entry while not experiencing significant thermal loads. The configuration increases drag, as the craft is now less streamlined and results in more atmospheric gas particles hitting the spacecraft at higher altitudes than otherwise. The aircraft thus slows down more in higher atmospheric layers which is the key to efficient re-entry. Secondly the aircraft will automatically orient itself in this state to a high drag attitude. However, the velocity attained by Spaceship One prior to re-entry is much lower than that of an orbital spacecraft, and engineers, including Rutan, recognize that a feathered re-entry technique is not suitable for return from orbit. On May 4, 2011, the first test on the Spaceship Two of the feathering mechanism was made during a glider flight after release from the White Knight II. The feathered re-entry was first described by Dean Chapman of NACA in 1958. In the section of his report on composite entry, Chapman described a solution to the problem using a high drag device. It may be desirable to combine lifting and non-lifting entry in order to achieve some advantages. For landing maneuverability it obviously is advantageous to employ a lifting vehicle. The total heat absorbed by a lifting vehicle, however, is much higher than for a non-lifting vehicle. Non-lifting vehicles can more easily be constructed by employing, for example, a large, light drag device. The larger the device, the smaller is the heating rate. Non-lifting vehicles with shuttlecock stability are advantageous also from the viewpoint of minimum control requirements during entry. An evident composite type of entry, which combines some of the desirable features of lifting and non-lifting trajectories, would be to enter first without lift but with a drag device. Then, when the velocity is reduced to a certain value, the device is jettisoned or retracted, leaving a lifting vehicle. For the remainder of the descent, inflatable heat shield re-entry, deceleration for atmospheric re-entry, especially for high-speed Mars return missions, benefits from maximizing the drag area of the entry system. The larger the diameter of the Engel shell, the bigger the payload can be. An inflatable Engel shell provides one alternative for enlarging the drag area with a low mass design. Such an inflatable shield aero brake was designed for the penetrators of Mars 96 mission. Since the mission failed due to the launcher malfunction, the NPO Levochkin and DASA ESA have designed a mission for Earth orbit. The inflatable re-entry and descent technology demonstrator was launched on Soyuz Fregat on February 8, 2000. The inflatable shield was designed as a cone with two stages of inflation. Although the second stage of the shield failed to inflate, the demonstrator survived the orbital re-entry and was recovered. The subsequent missions flown on the Volna rocket were not successful due to launcher failure. NASA launched an inflatable heat shield experimental spacecraft on August 17, 2009 with a successful first test flight of the inflatable re-entry vehicle experiment. The heat shield had been vacuum packed into a 15 inches diameter payload shroud and launched on a black brand 9 sounding rocket from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility on Wallops Island, Virginia. Nitrogen inflated the 10 foot diameter heat shield, made of several layers of silicone coated, Kevlar fabric, to a mushroom shape in space several minutes after liftoff. The rocket apogee was at an altitude of 131 miles where it began its descent to supersonic speed. Less than a minute later the shield was released from its cover to inflate at an altitude of 124 miles. The inflation of the shield took less than 90 seconds. Entry Vehicle Design Considerations There are four critical parameters considered when designing a vehicle for atmospheric entry, peak heat flux, heat load, peak deceleration, peak dynamic pressure, peak heat flux and dynamic pressure selects the TPS material. Heat load selects the thickness of the TPS material stack. Peak deceleration is of major importance for manned missions. The upper limit for manned return to Earth from low Earth orbit or lunar return is 10 gs. For Martian atmospheric entry after long exposure to zero gravity, the upper limit is 4 gs. Peak dynamic pressure can also influence the selection of the outermost TPS material if spallation is an issue. 
starting from the principle of conservative design, the engineer typically considers two worst-case trajectories, the undershoot and overshoot trajectories. The overshoot trajectory is typically defined as the shallowest allowable entry velocity angle prior to atmospheric skip-off. The overshoot trajectory has the highest heat load and sets the TPS thickness. The undershoot trajectory is defined by the steepest allowable trajectory. For manned missions the steepest entry angle is limited by the peak deceleration. The undershoot trajectory also has the highest peak heat flux and dynamic pressure. Consequently, the undershoot trajectory is the basis for selecting the TPS material. There is no one-size-fits-all TPS material. A TPS material that is ideal for high heat flux may be too conductive for a long-duration heat load. A low-density TPS material might lack the tensile strength to resist spallation if the dynamic pressure is too high. A TPS material can perform well for a specific peak heat flux, but fail catastrophically for the same peak heat flux if the wall pressure is significantly increased. Older TPS materials tend to be more labor-intensive and expensive to manufacture compared to modern materials. However, modern TPS materials often lack the flight history of the older materials. Based upon Allen and Egger's discovery, maximum Enrichal bluntness yields minimum TPS mass. Maximum bluntness also yields a minimal terminal velocity at maximum altitude. However, there is an upper limit to bluntness imposed by aerodynamic stability considerations based upon shock wave detachment. A shock wave will remain attached to the tip of a sharp cone if the cone's half angle is below a critical value. This critical half angle can be estimated using perfect gas theory. For a nitrogen atmosphere, the maximum allowed half angle is approximately 60 a degree. For a carbon dioxide atmosphere, the maximum allowed half angle is approximately 70 a degree. Aftershock wave detachment, an entry vehicle must carry significantly more shock air gas around the leading edge stagnation point. Consequently, the aerodynamic center moves upstream thus causing aerodynamic instability. It is incorrect to reapply an Enrichal design intended for Titan entry for Mars entry. Prior to being abandoned, the Soviet Mars lander program achieved one successful landing, on the second of three entry attempts. The Soviet Mars landers were based upon a 60-degree half-angle Enrichal design. A 45-degree half-angle sphere cone is typically used for atmospheric probes even though TPS mass is not minimized. The rationale for a 45-degree half-angle is to have either aerodynamic stability from entry to impact or a short and sharp heat pulse followed by prompt heat shield jettison. A 45-degree sphere cone design was used with the DS-2 Mars Impactor and Pioneer Venus probes. Notable Atmospheric Entry Accidents Not all atmospheric re-entries have been successful and some have resulted in significant disasters. Thos Clod to a Euro the service module failed to detach for some time, but the crew survived. Soyuz 1 a Euro the attitude control system failed while still in orbit and later parachutes got entangled during the emergency landing sequence failure. Lone cosmonaut Vladimir Mikhailovich Kumarov died. Soyuz 5 a Euro the service module failed to detach, but the crew survived. Mars Polar Lander a Euro failed during EDL. The failure was believed to be the consequence of a software error. The precise cause is unknown for lack of real-time telemetry. Space Shuttle Columbia during STS-1, a combination of launch damage, protruding gap filler and tile installation error have resulted in serious damage to the orbiter. Have the exact extent of damage been known before landing, the crew would bail out once reaching a safe altitude. The orbiter proceed to normal landing netherless. Space Shuttle Columbia during STS-107 a Euro the failure of an RCC panel on a wing leading edge led to breakup of the orbiter at hypersonic speed resulting in the deaths of all seven crew members. Genesis a Euro the parachute failed to deploy due to a G-switch having been installed backwards. Consequently, the Genesis entry vehicle crashed into the desert floor. The payload was damaged, but most scientific data were recoverable. Soyuz TMA-11 a Euro the Soyuz propulsion module failed to separate properly. 
fallback ballistic re-entry was executed that subjected the crew to forces about eight times that of gravity. The crew survived. Uncontrolled and unprotected re-entries, of satellites that re-enter, approximately 10 to 40 percent of the mass of the object is likely to reach the surface of the Earth. On average, about one catalogued object re-enters per day. Due to the Earth's surface being primarily water, most objects that survive re-entry land in one of the world's oceans. The estimated chances that a given person will get hit and injured during his her lifetime is around one in a trillion. In 1978, Cosmos 954 re-entered uncontrolled and crashed near Great Slave Lake in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Cosmos 954 was nuclear-powered and left radioactive debris near its impact site. In 1979, Scalab re-entered uncontrolled, spreading debris across the Australian outback, damaging several buildings and killing a cow. The re-entry was a major media event largely due to the Cosmos 954 incident, but not viewed as much as a potential disaster since it did not carry nuclear fuel. The city of Esperance, Western Australia, issued a fine for littering to the United States, which was finally paid 30 years later. NASA had originally hoped to use a space shuttle mission to either extend its life or enable a controlled re-entry, but delays in the program combined with unexpectedly high solar activity made this impossible. On February 7, 1991 Salyut 7 underwent uncontrolled re-entry with Cosmos 1686. Re-entering over Argentina, scattering much of its debris over the town of Capitan Bermudez. Equals deorbit disposal equals in 1971, the world's first space station Salyut 1 was deliberately deorbited into the Pacific Ocean following the Soyuz 11 accident. Its successor, Salyut 6, was deorbited in a controlled manner as well. On June 4, 2000 the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory was deliberately deorbited after one of its gyroscopes failed. The debris that did not burn up fell harmlessly into the Pacific Ocean. The observatory was still operational but the failure of another gyroscope would have made deorbiting much more difficult and dangerous. With some controversy, NASA decided in the interest of public safety that a controlled crash was preferable to letting the craft come down at random. In 2001, the Russian Mir space station was deliberately deorbited, and broke apart in the fashion expected by the command center during atmospheric re-entry. Mir entered the Earth's atmosphere on March 23, 2001, near Nodi, Fiji, and fell into the South Pacific Ocean. On February 21, 2008, a disabled U.S. spy satellite, USA-193, was successfully hit at an altitude of approximately 246 kilometers by an SM-3 missile fired from the U.S. Navy cruiser Lake Erie off the coast of Hawaii. The satellite was inoperative, having failed to reach its intended orbit when it was launched in 2006. Due to its rapidly deteriorating orbit, it was destined for uncontrolled re-entry within a month. United States Department of Defense expressed concern that the 1,000-pound fuel tank containing highly toxic hydrazine might survive re-entry to reach the Earth a Euro unregistered trademark S surface intact. Several governments including those of Russia, China, and Belarus protested the action as a thinly veiled demonstration of U.S. anti-satellite capabilities. China had previously caused an international incident when it tested an anti-satellite missile in 2007. On September 7, 2011, NASA announced the impending uncontrolled re-entry of upper atmosphere research satellite and noted that there was a small risk to the public. The decommissioned satellite re-entered the atmosphere on September 24, 2011, and some pieces are presumed to have crashed into the South Pacific Ocean over a debris field 500 miles long. Successful atmospheric re-entries from orbital velocities, manned orbital re-entry, by country governmental entity, China, Shenzhou, Soviet Union slash Russia, Vostok, Voskhod, Soyuz, United States, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Space Shuttle, manned orbital re-entry, by commercial entity, none to date, unmanned orbital re-entry, by country governmental entity, China, European Space Agency, India slash Indian Space Research Organization, Japan, Soviet Union slash Russia, United States, 
unmanned orbital reentry, by commercial entity, SpaceX, Dragon. Selected atmospheric reentries. See also Landing, air capture, decelerated micrometeorites, ionization blackout, landing footprint, skip reentry, space shuttle thermal protection system, lander, space capsule, spaceplane. Further reading, Launius, Roger D. Jenkins, Dennis R. Coming Home, Reentry and Recovery from Space. NASA ISBN 9780160910647. OCLC 802182873. Retrieved August 21, 2014. Martin, John J. Atmospheric Entry, An Introduction to Its Science and Engineering. Old Tappan, New Jersey, Prentice Hall. Reagan, Frank J. Reentry Vehicle Dynamics. New York, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Inc. ISBN 0-915928-78-7. Eatkin, Bernard. Dynamics of Atmospheric Flight. New York, John Wiley & Sons, Inc. ISBN 0-471-24620-4. Vincenti, Walter G. Kruger, J.R., Charles H. Introduction to Physical Gas Dynamics. Malabar, Florida, Robert E. Krager Publishing Company. ISBN 0-88275-309-6. Hansen, C. Frederick. Molecular Physics of Equilibrium Gases, A Handbook for Engineers. NASA NASA SP3096. Hayes, Wallace D. Probstein, Ronald F. Hypersonic Flow Theory. New York and London, Academic Press. A revised version of this classic text has been reissued as an inexpensive paperback, Hayes, Wallace D. Hypersonic Unviscid Flow. Minula, New York, Dover Publications. ISBN 0-486-43281-5. Reissued in 2004, Anderson, J.R., John D. Hypersonic and High Temperature Gas Dynamics. New York, McGraw-Hill, Inc. ISBN 0-07-001671-2. Notes and References. External links, Center for Orbital and Reentry Debris Studies. Early Reentry Vehicles, Blunt Bodies and Ablatives, Buren's Heat Shield, Encyclopedia Astronautica article on the history of space rescue crafts, including some reentry craft designs. Atmospheric Entry Citizendium article, EADS Astrium.